This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week, we've got Robert Bavarian Bob Blockinger joining us. We're going to call this one One Man's Journey to Carve a Niche for Flooring Forensics in the Cleaning and Restoration Industry. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsor. They're the reason we're still here. Please let our sponsors know how much you appreciate their support of IAQ Radio. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute at CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association at IAQA.org, the Restoration Industry Association at RestorationIndustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org, and Healthy Buildings America 2021 at HB2021-America.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions at graywolfsensing.com, TSI Inc. at tsi.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Don Weeks in Ontario, Canada who was first to identify omega-3 fatty acids as the substance that gives snake oil its anti-inflammatory properties. The IQ Radio Trivia question for today, Friday, February 5, 2021, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI Com. Here is today's IAQ Radio trivia question. What is the oldest consumer protection law still in existence? Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, Bob Blockager has got a long career in both construction and cleaning and restoration. His career most recently is focused on the forensic review of floor covering products that have a negative impact on performance, appearance, and use. He's a multidiscipline floor consultant and also works as an expert witness, inspector, and investigator for law firms, condominium associations, and flooring manufacturers. Welcome to IAQ Radio Plus, Bob. Thank you. Great to have you on. Uh, It's great to have you on board. Um, You're you're now a Moisture Mob associate. This is one of our Moisture Mob shows here, and a Brooklyn boy helped organize today's show. In the spirit of the Restoration Global Watchdog, a little clarification, if you could. A little insight into how you got your Moisture Mob nickname, Bavarian Bob, and what it means to speak Brooklynese, Bob. <laughs> My nickname uh, comes from the fact that I was born in Germany, in the state of Bavaria, and uh, immigrated to the United States in the early 50s as a young child. So therefore, Bavarian Bob happened because that's where I'm from. And as far as Brooklynese, well, I spent uh, approximately 15 years living in New York City. Uh, most of that time was in the German section of Brooklyn, where I learned the street talk, which I labeled Brooklynese. And it's basically like, uh, you talking to me? <laughs> or, uh, what are you, stupid? And uh, the other one, uh, whatchamacallit? Yeah. There's a few others I can probably come up with, but uh, the public wouldn't appreciate them. 
Uh, I hear you. I hear you, Bob. Um, you know, you started out doing construction in the family business. What type of construction did you do? Did your, did your family do up in New York? We did uh, back then the steam cleaning of the uh, brownstone buildings with, uh, you know, chemical acids, which probably are outlawed today. Uh, painting window trims, uh, doing s concrete slabs, driveways, uh, painting fences, and uh, exchanging windows for newer windows, all basically light construction, uh, not too much structural construction. And I, I would say 50% has been me as a uh, concrete finisher and pour. Oh, okay. And so you've kind of naturally migrated into the floor coverings on top of those concrete floors you finished, huh? Well, when I moved to Florida and I continued in, in the family business, uh, we were on a job site and I saw the guys uh, putting in carpeting. And I got to talking to them and they said, yeah, we work in air conditioning. Well, I kind of switched over and I found out they lied. But <laughs> I've been stuck in, uh, in floor covering in all facets because uh, it's interesting. And uh, as long as you run your business, it's profitable. Interesting. All right. You know, you've been involved in just about every aspect of the flooring business. Um, from your perspective, where are we today with flooring? It seems like, you know, trends come and go. What's the most important trend today in flooring? Well, I've been out of the retail section for quite some time, but because of my inspection work, most of my inspections today are geared towards the uh, LVT products, the, li the luxury vinyl tiles. Um, they are uh, sensitive to many different uh, environments within the space. Then the hospitality market, I get involved in maintenance and uh, sometimes on the installation because the uh, training of installers is uh, very poor in this country, although it's trying to get better. Uh, residentially, it would be in this, in my uh, location, it's hard surface such as marble, ceramic tile, travertine, and uh, porcelain tile is one of the bigger uh, products being sold. And that's what I've been looking at for uh, for past few years is porcelain failures, which is not so much the product, but the installation. And we do have some product failures because the short planks are bowed and it's hard to get rid of the lippage. Hmm. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, well, um, you know, I, I guess in terms of, you know, my questions are probably, uh, you know, inspection related, I think things that I've run into, uh, you know, falling hurricanes down in, uh, in South Florida. And, um, you know, the problems that I ran into were all, all hurricane related, all the homes were built on slabs, and they either had marble, ceramic tile or terrazzo installed in them. And none of these houses ever took more than six inches of standing water you know, using a uh, Tramex meter, uh, I was able to determine that there was moisture, you know, in the floor and under the floor. And the floors appeared to be in good condition with no staining, no discoloration or, or wicking. You know, the issues were, you know, must the floors be replaced or are they salvageable? You know, on these claims, it wouldn't be unusual to have a public adjuster and he's going to insist that the floor is a total loss and that we can't do destructive testing because uh, there's no leftover tiles and we can't match it. And, you know, the whole house needs to be ripped up and, uh, and, and, and torn up. And I, I guess question number one is I suspect that you have encountered this situation and I'm looking for some insight on you know, how, how you handled it. Well, I've been involved in many floor coverings to that extent, uh, either working for the consumer or working for the uh, contractor or working for the uh, actual insurance company who sends me out to see if it's a viable claim or not. So starting with Terrazzo, um, up until air conditioning was, uh, rampant, not rampant, uh, was uh, commonplace in South Florida, which would be from the 1970s on. Uh, terrazzo was used because it was a cool floor during, you know, the windows open, air movers, uh, fans going on, 
So they used terrazzo with a Portland-based cement content or, or uh, uh, application, and that was put directly onto the concrete floor. Well, being porous, because it's got a base of Portland cement, whatever moisture was in the concrete would emit through the terrazzo and there'd be no lifting. When they found out they could do terrazzo floors with an epoxy based, well, if the concrete uh, slab was not measured correctly for moisture content, if it was not prepared correctly, the epoxy based terrazzo would pop off because it can't uh, uh, absorb the water push or the moisture push coming north. So in that, those are two cases where yes, the terrazzo floor is still good or no, it's gotta be replaced. Now, going to marble, stone, um, ceramic tile, <clears throat> typically when there's a water event uh, and it goes on top of the, um, the stone floor, it no normally does not go 100% into the uh, cavities between the, the stone floor and the concrete because the way the trowel is, uh, the trowel notch is, or the trowel is swung on the uh, floor, it doesn't have a straight line from one side to the other. There's crisscross uh, cavities from the trowel notches. So that prevents water from coming through, even though there may be some absorption because it is a port, the setting material is porous, but it's also uh, mud, mud, it's a mud set, which is Portland, Portland cement based. And then we have thin set if they have what we call the Miami sandwich on the original installation, if there's thin set applied to the concrete uh, surface, then you have mud set, then you have a thin set applied to the mud set, then you have thin set butted on the back of the tile and you put it down and it's good to go. Uh, as far as staining, uh, of course, marble is the easiest to stain and uh, you may have some color change, but it's not necessarily within the tile. You can uh, call in someone to clean it with the correct chemicals, perhaps honing and um, that would take care of that. Uh, the argument that you made with the public adjusters, that would be a judgment call between the insurance company and the public adjuster or homeowner, even though there's an expert coming in to give his opinion. I've been in jobs where the consumer did prevail in the decision uh, for whatever reasons, uh, you know, that were not my, I was not privy to. And as okay. far as using meters, uh, I use Tramex as well, and that goes approximately three quarters of an inch down, um, maybe an inch at the most. And that's where all the water content is in a slab anyway, in a concrete slab. As far as using it into marble, yeah, we can determine if there's moisture within the marble with the meter, or at times it's got discoloration. Okay. Uh, what about drying it? You know, there are a lot of restoration companies that are heavily involved in drying. They've got a ton of money invested in all sorts of equipment and gadgets and gizmos and accessories. And, you know, do these floors need to be dried? If you had marble, if you had uh, terrazzo, if you had ceramic tile and it's installed on cement, uh, you know, Portland cement, does it have to be dried or is it going to dry naturally? Use of uh, dry out systems is quite normal. Um, some of it can be overkill where they dry it out to the point, let's say for five days when it should have been three or four, uh, they put in uh, four humidifiers when two probably would have worked. And the, what happens is the building materials such as drywall, um, drywall compound, uh, paint, wood, especially wood, wood moldings, wood flooring, if it's overkill on the drying side, well, it shrinks the materials and now you got to go back and fix it because you created something that wasn't there before because of the dry out. So it's very important to be careful how, we, how many units, where you put them and how long they operate and, e and keep up with the daily monitoring by having an actual person visit the job site and take readings of the ambient conditions within. Um, Case in point, uh, I have a job, or I had a job a couple of years back where I was called in to look at the second floor wood flooring because there were large gaps. The water event happened on the bottom floor, which was uh, stone. The drywall was taken out three feet up, four feet up. Uh, at, by the time I got there, the, the drywall 
cavities were covered with plastic and the, the equipment was taken out. So I was, I was hired to determine was this wood floor gapped prior to the water event? Water did not go up to the second floor. Everything origin, originated on the first. Well, it was a judgment call, even though I took measurements of within the ambient, uh, actual measurements of planks, whatnot. Uh, I determined that of a approximately 2000, it was a large home, 2000 square feet on the second floor of, of tongue and groove, nailed down on plywood, uh, wood plank. I only found four uh, areas were gapped and they ran the length of the room. So, and the, uh, some of the wood was cupped. Now, that was an unusual gapping situation. Usually if it's insulation or moisture related, the gapping is uh, in multiple areas within a space and this one, it was limited. So I determined that the dry out was a causation for the, um, the gapping of the planks. Mm -hmm. So, so, so as, you could have, could have uh, I guess, secondary damage caused by the drying equipment yes. that, that they didn't, it's a consequence that no one thought about. You know, my right. last question, in regards to it is that, you know, living in Florida, you know, with hurricanes, uh, you know, that water can have salt in it. And um, have you seen any damage uh, to, you know, to concrete, to ceramic tile, to marble, uh, you know, due to this salt? Uh, you know, is that gonna be destructive immediately? Is that gonna be destructive over time? Um, is it really a problem or is it not? I'm going to go back to 1992 when Hurricane Andrew came through South Florida and changed the world we live in and mm -hmm. changed everything that the insurance companies had in their policies. Uh, we basically had the ocean come through uh, homes, flooding the streets, and with it came sea creatures, let alone mm -hmm. the, water, the salt in the water. As everything evaporated, the rugs, the carpets, the furniture, the upholstery, the... Uh, the wall board, the drywall uh, dried out and there was alkalinity or salt composites in there. And uh, it does affect, too much salt does affect these, these uh, building materials. As far as the flooring goes, uh, if it's real serious, uh, we're gonna have efflorescence coming from the um, right. setting materials and from the concrete slab, which is actually uh, a calcium powder and that will create staining that you can't get out. So then you go into possibly uh, testing it in area with, with uh, cleaners and honing the marble. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a porcelain tile, it's etched and it's done because you can't do anything with porcelain tile, it's glass. So uh, there is the, uh, damage caused by salt residues because after all, it is an alkalinity type of situation and, and it can create problems and damage. Thank you very much. I had some good comments from listeners that they liked the discussion uh, and information you provide. Back to you, Joe. Yep. In the second half, what, what we'll do is we'll pull up some, some uh, photos that illustrate a little more in a little more detail what Bob was just talking about. But before we do that, let's set a little more of the foundation here. Um, Bob, in your experience, what are the most common mistakes that contractors make? You know, just general contractors putting in flooring. Uh, what, what mistakes do they commonly make that lead to a forensic specialist like yourself being called in? Um, I'm going to talk about a case that I'm just about to start because I feel that uh, answering with ex real life examples is better than just giving theory based on a book I read. So, Monday, I'm going to a job site. I was hired by a re remediation contractor uh, through contractor connection to take a look at this job where a vinyl floor was replaced. It's a resident. And uh, he showed me the, uh, the, the, the specification sheet of the products that went down, a vinyl floor, the adhesive use and whatnot. Turns out, uh, after remediation and the floor was ready to be uh, replaced, the flooring installer did not do any moisture testing in the concrete. Well, that's mm -hmm. one mistake. Then the next thing is he may have uh, used excessive glue. In other words, the volume of glue applied with the trowel, perhaps the notch was too big and the glue started oozing through the uh, 
tile joints. This is a, a, a LVT plank. And so I'm going Monday to, to find out what they did wrong and to do some moisture testing. I'm doing the ASTM 2170 for, four, for 24 hours. And um, at that point, I can determine exactly what the installer did wrong. And I'm going to say the first thing is the general contractor uh, perhaps did not research the installer. If, is he uh, viable? Is he trained? Is he experienced? Uh, does he have any certifications? Does he understand moisture in concrete and how it affects moisture sensitive uh, adhesives and uh, products? And then I'm going to make a quick comment on training because training is missing in this country. And that's keeping people like myself extremely busy. What? Yeah, that's a good question or, or a good point, Bob, the training of these contractors. I know, you know, we have a little construction company up here at the lake. I'll guarantee you not one of these contractors in the area has ever attended any flooring installation training. They just, you know, look at the manufacturer's recommendations. They go in and install it. They don't check for moisture. Um, and, but I don't see a ton of callbacks. We do get some. Um, how important is the correct type of adhesive in the, in the example you just gave? I mean, if, if a floor, if a concrete slab is, is a little more moist than you would like, um, are there adhesive alternatives you can use that will help with that? If uh, after doing some testing with the, let's say the ACM 2170 or the 1869 and you get elevated readings of moisture content, you have to determine uh, the next question, do I need to uh, scarify the concrete surface, apply a moisture barrier, uh, what quality of moisture barrier is required? And at that point, you open a question of a change order, which and nobody likes a change order because that means more money. So you try to fiddle around that, and then you go to the product you're putting down and you call up the manufacturer, what's your suggested adhesives that will chemically marry between the tile back and the concrete surface? So then you, you are suggested maybe a moisture adhesive that has a 95% uh, um, I'm going to say ratio against moisture content coming through or breaking it down. Some are 99%. At times, you can get a job-specific warranty from the adhesive manufacturer. I've done that in the past, which means you submit your testing results, your floor preparation procedures with photographs and support material, and they will give you or perhaps will give you a, uh, uh, an extended warranty for that particular job using because you've done it their way and by the book. Um, but training, well, I kind of like say, you got to read the damn label. If you don't read the label, don't start. <laughs> um, That's a mild book, Brooklyn East, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what type of flooring do you have in your home, Bob? I have a uh, new product that is a, uh, they call it waterproof. It's a laminate. It's got a, uh, a fully resin core with a beautiful wood surface, uh, wood-like surface on the top. And I had to get that because my wife liked the color. <laughs> and I wanted to have a floating floor. You have a floating floor? Yeah, it's a floating laminate. Click. Floating click. laminate. Okay. Is it, is, would it be considered a luxury plank or is that? No, uh, laminate, laminate. Laminate flooring is totally different from the uh, LVT because the LVT is basically 100% uh, petroleum-based products, vinyl, plastic. Uh, plastic. The uh, the interior core can be uh, a limestone-based material. We have the SPC and the WPC. One is wood core, and the other one is a, uh, a stone-like core. And uh, laminate is a um, typically a, a wood product or wood byproduct uh, core with a, I call it a mica on the back. And then you have the veneer being the uh, picture of the wood with a clear coat. And um, it's, sometimes it's vinyl, but not very much. Two okay. different species. What I, I want, I'm curious too about buildings that are vacant right now because of COVID. Um, do you expect to see issues with flooring in these buildings when, when people go back? 
Yes. And the reason I say that, um, going back to the hurricane comment, when we have hurricanes here and we are without power for 24 hours to three, four weeks, uh, there's nothing going on inside the building. So we, we gain uh, temperature and humidity and that creates other things that uh, happen to the flooring and it depends on what type of flooring because then we, we start getting bacterial growth. Moist, moisture, uh, the interior moisture will break down the adhesives and in the COVID related, where the office may have had 50 people and now it's got three people and in a few months, maybe the 50 will come back. You have a uh, consideration that is the HVAC system operating as it would be if it had uh, many people in it or is, it, is, you know, is the environmental conditions changed? Are they elevated to the point they can create a problem? Uh, that's the only thing I see going on. I guess the other thing that, that I think is a potential issue is that if you don't have people in there, just eyes and ear, you know, just seeing if there's something going on that might lead to a problem, a little leak or whatever other kind of issue. Um, I would also assume they're not bringing in the, the maintenance people as often or the cleaning people as often. And then um, you, you kind of don't have that early warning system, but uh, very interesting. Yeah, I can agree with that. Go ahead. I can agree to that with uh, there's less maintenance involved because there's less people being used. So they figure, well, let me cut back some money. And uh, you don't, like I said, you don't have the eyes and the ears of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's get one more in before halftime. I want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, are you concerned? Well, let's go to this. The IICRC just put out a new flooring standard um, and I want to know, first of all, were you involved with that standard? How were you involved? I know that you've been pushing hard to make sure that these, you know, flooring forensics and hard surface people uh, have a place to go within the IICRC. Let's talk a little bit about the new standard they put out and uh, your involvement with it. Is that the um, resilient uh, inspection? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was involved somewhat in the beginning. And uh, my name is in there because I'm the uh, current inspection division chair for the IICRC. Uh, I did have a little uh, oversight, but not much, but I do have a, brand, I have a new copy. I read through most of it and it's a good document. It gives you a path of inspection protocol for resilient flooring. Uh, they do mention uh, sheet goods, LVT, VCT, and the other types of resilient flooring we have today. Um, it's all about a how to and why to perform inspection. So you have a complete and honest conclusion at the end. It's a good product. Interesting. And that, that division, um, how, how are things going with, I know they were trying to grow it back when I was you know, working with the IICRC. Are you seeing growth in this area, the hard surface and floor coverings? There will be growth. Uh, I've only had this position for uh, three months now. Uh, okay. I did come up with a newsletter that was uh, sent out in January, um, articles on inspection. And I also uh, put in a blurb for articles, anybody in the inspection industry, which wants to submit an article to us for publication because the way I see it when you, if you're involved in legal work they love the fact that you've been published someplace yes and, sir um, I've our IICRC is uh, heavily involved in promoting inspection now in all their venues and of course whenever I go someplace or speak like this radio show I promote inspection as a career path when you need to get off your knees and stand up for a living <laughs> that's a good one there yeah sooner or later we all get to that point huh, Bob? Yes, all right sure. i think what i'd like to do here is stop for halftime we're going to thank our sponsors we're going to be back shortly with bavarian bob blockinger here we're talking about hard flooring coverings and uh we're going to get into a little more detail in the second half and show some some photos and give people a little more, a few more tips on how to deal with inspection of, uh, of these types of services. So we'll be right back. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, 
and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, at AIHA.org. ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, at ACGIH.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research at CIRIScience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, promoting the exchange of indoor environmental quality information through education and research at IAQA.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry, network with leaders at restorationindustry.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry at IICRC.org. And Healthy Buildings America 2021 in Honolulu, Hawaii, August 10 through 12, 2021 at hb2021-america.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same-day results with no rush fee at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us at ParticlesPlus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions. Over 20 years manufacturing accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable, short-term, and continuous monitoring at graywolfsensing.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at tsi.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers at healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back. We've got Robert Bob Blockinger here. Bob, before we uh, broke, we were talking a little bit about the um, IICRC, the standard S220 for professional inspection of hard surface floor coverings. I want to kind of combine two questions here. Um, When we talk about moisture and flooring, you mentioned a couple of ASTM standards. Um, And and I want to, you know, we've had several shows with the moisture mob and their concerns about the use of relative humidity testing and, you know, putting a little uh, humidity gauges down into the concrete versus just using a moisture meter. First of all, how does the IICRC standard handle that? I believe we actually mentioned uh, all of the common common testing methods. Um, we are not, um, I'm speaking for myself now, um, I believe as an organization, we're not involved in the ASTM standards protocol on how to do testing. We write standards on other topics. And as far as I'm concerned, again, me speaking, uh, using the uh, calcium chloride 1869, which is a non-invasive test, uh, compared to the uh, 18, I'm sorry, the 2170, which is an invasive test, or the hood test, which is non-invasive. Each one has a place. Um, on larger jobs, let's say uh, a 10,000, 20,000 square foot job where I'm putting down 20, you know, 20, 25 uh, units, I will do a sampling of both. I'll use majority of the 2170, and I also do some of the calcium chloride because there are still some resilient flooring manufacturers that like the calcium chloride test. There's also the problem with <clears throat> some concrete slabs, uh, such as post tension, you cannot drill without mm-hmm. first having a uh, land radar go over every square inch to find out where the cables are, and therefore you can drill where the cables are not. If you snap one of those cables, we're all done. So each, each test has a place within the industry. Each one tells us something that's going on. And uh, I've talked to some experts who, one of them told me that the, it's like testing the blood pressure and temperature of yourself. Uh, 
they each can tell you something. When you have both, they tell you something really is wrong with you, but you cannot measure, you cannot compare the two tests. One is your blood pressure and one is your temperature. So, and then you have the final test, which is a Matt Bond test, which is where you actually take the pro a sample of sampling of the product properly, uh, let's say a square yard in size, glue it down, let it settle, let it uh, absorb, let it uh, adhere and see what happens to it a few days later. If it comes up, well, it, you got to do some work. If it stays, then you're probably good to go. But you still have to do some sort of testing of the concrete because if you're using adhesive, 99% of the time, it's gonna be a moisture-based adhesive that can be attacked by the moisture emissions. Okay, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned these different types of, of testing and, and concrete and on an earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, moisture mop show, <clears throat> I don't remember exactly who it was, but I think most of the moisture mop folks felt that it was more common for moisture issues on slabs to be the result of the environment around the slab as opposed to from moisture coming up through the slab or from the sides of the slab. What's your experience there? What's the most common way you see moisture issues on a slab? You're talking about the, the envelope building. Um, I currently have a case in uh, Cocoa Beach, Florida with about 80 units that uh, has exactly that problem. It's the envelope of the building that's creating a moisture emission within the uh, ambient conditions because these units were built in the 1950s and 60s when air conditioning was not prevalent. It had jealousy awning windows and uh, fans. Now through a rehab, they have the hurricane windows, they have the hurricane doors, they have a new roof they have an HVAC system that is uh, central and they put down VCT with a uh, VCT adhesive. Well, I was called in and the VCT joints the, between the tiles is all black because the adhesive that's water-based is oozing through. And as they walk on it, general soiling, whatever, uh, we have a black outline of the tile. Now through that, the it, previous flooring, because again, it was from the 50s and 60s and installations of the 70s, uh, was VAT with cutback. That's a petroleum-based adhesive, it's black. There are rules that you've got to remove uh, a certain percentage of the uh, cutback and you can leave a residue, again, a certain percentage. But in time, because now you broke the, I'm gonna say the, uh, uh, you compromise the, the uh, cut back adhesives qualities, some of the moisture is coming through, it's taking the particles of the adhesive, the black particles with it, and it's joined the um, VCT adhesive, which now has become mush because it was attacked by moisture and it's oozing through the tile. Well, I went with a professional engineer about a month ago, walking through 10 sample buildings, and his report, he determined that it's the envelope of the building that's creating most of the problem because uh, as I mentioned, it's all hurricane sealed windows and doors and whatnot, and nothing is coming through from the outside air. So inside environment, uh, the humidity is still running around 60%, and it's gotten so bad that the paint on the drywall on the ceiling has bubbled. Well, hmm. that's not a concrete moisture issue. That's an envelope of the building issue, issue and they're trying to find out uh, how the HVAC system is uh, is developed, not developed, uh, installed to see if the air exchange with the exterior is enough to give it fresh air on the interior so we don't have this problem. Okay, let's, John, let's put up some slides, Bob. What I'd like to do is quickly go through some of these slides we looked at earlier. And just maybe if you could explain a little, you know, it's kind of nice to tie a photo to a concept. So, let me let you take it from here. This looks like the view from one of the projects you were on. This is uh, Miami Beach. And uh, at times people get jealous because I get to go to the penthouses on the oceanfront condominium. <laughs> nice view. John, next. Okay, here's the problem. Okay, the problem is we have an existing uh, marble floor. Uh, the con It's a penthouse condo. I believe it's got 12-foot ceilings and the... Uh, 
one of the water pipes burst. And so we had a water event. The, I came in after dry out and you see the plastic is still up. And um, what we have where the plastic is sort of bunched up in the middle center of the building, I mean, of the uh, photograph, uh, it's the marble is nice and shiny where the marble was not covered with plastic. We have a white substance. That white substance is FLORES that came up through the marble and also the drywall dust from all the work that was going on. I, the next slide will show the, um, the pH of that, which is uh, sitting at 1112. So what, the, what I asked for was to have a marble restore professional come in and he was able, we did a test spot of about uh, 10 square feet, was successful. So we, we cleaned the entire space and everything was good. Okay, there's this another is, one though. This goes this back to what a, Cliff was talking about. This is another condo where there was a uh, black water leak. And um, you can see the two black rings around the white pipe. That's where uh, they put a, uh, I'm gonna call it a nipple that was put in this place. Yes, right there. And uh, my job was to uh, evaluate the marble floor if there was any damage due to the water leak. And of course they went through the dry out system. So I determined that the marble, uh, I used the, the sounding test with a tapping stick, uh, moisture meters, black light. And uh, I was able to determine that the marble was not damaged. It just- Was there any, Bob, good on that. Was there any color run from that oriental carpet? No, uh, that staining? was placed afterwards. There was no color run. Okay. Okay, thanks. Good. Next one, John. All right, here's another one. I think you may have mentioned this one earlier, Bob. Yes, I did. This was the dry out where the second floor was wood and the wood gapped. Um, here I'm taking my 10 board measurements. There's the gap. Uh, it, within that room, there's only one a few feet into the room. Then I have a slide showing the um, that one where it shrank along the uh, doorway transition and the, the bottom of the uh, door jamb. And this one, you determined is, was was because they had been drying. The, they overdried. They overdried the building, and uh, we had cracking. Uh, some of the sealer, sealer, the uh, corking was cracking. The uh, the wood moldings on the ceiling were were slightly uh, shrank. So that was an overdrive. John, go back to that last one again, if you would. Go back where he said the ten board. No, no, no. Back with the rulers on the floor. Keep oh, that, that hey. one. When you yeah. said you said a ten, I, maybe I misunderstood. Ten board. Part of a part of a wood flooring inspection um, for shrinkage. You measure across ten boards. If let's say you have a a, a single board at five inch, well, you measure 10, 10 different boards to see if it's sitting at uh, fifty inches. So that is consistent. I got you. Okay. Okay. Great, John. Let's go to the next one. Keep going. Hey, Joe, Joe, wait, hey, Joe, go ahead, if you go, go back a second. Okay. Um, a couple of real important questions on this. Um, you know, my experience is that refrigerant, uh, even you know, low grain refrigerant dehumidification, typically is not going to over dry. Uh, particularly, I would think in a Florida environment. So it would seem to me that either heat was used here or desiccant equipment was, was used here. And I'm just looking for you know, confirmation of whether that's what happened or not. Well, heat was used because they also suspected bacterial growth and they wanted to make sure everything was uh, okay. Uh, okay, gotcha. Okay. All right. So heat, it was a Thank heat diet. All right, good. That's a very good, very, very good example. Uh, excellent. Let's go to this one, Bob. Absolutely. This is LVT planks, uh, luxury vinyl tile planks that is glued down. It's an office uh, environment. And where you see the red tape, that's where I lifted. I'm sorry, that's where a plank has lifted by itself. And the red tape was put down so it stays there. And where you have the U-shaped red tape, that's where I did a moisture test. And this is post-installation because you see... Uh, the end of the planks is peat. That means they expanded at, at the, um, 
No, you can't really see that. When, uh, okay, well. So I was called in to find out why the planks peaked. Okay, let's go to the next, there you go. Okay, that's a, that's a ASTM 2170. I'm using Wagner meter, um, where I just inserted, it's a one-time use meter. And uh, I did have the 24 hour test, I did have elevated um, relative humidity in the concrete. Now, I want you to notice that uh, all the white speckles that are around that, that's the concrete dust from my drill. Yes. And the concrete dust uh, tells me already that the concrete is really not that saturated with moisture, that we do have, uh, let's say, a lower relative humidity in that particular hole. Uh, oh, I don't oh. know if I have a picture of the other hole that I did, but when I, not that one, um, but when I drilled it, I had a concrete paste coming out of the hole. So mm -hmm. that tells me already it's highly excessive moisture in there. And of course the readings were 99. Yeah, that would be a good quick test too. If you, you wouldn't have to drill as big of a hole maybe, but uh, just drill down with a, maybe a half inch bit, see if it was dry it's, versus. It's, it's quick, but it's, uh, I don't know, one of them field ex expedient tests that uh, sure. is a judgment call. Okay. No science behind it. Let's go to the next one. What do we got here, Bob? That is the under underside of one of the planks that I pulled up, and I'm trying to. Sh I'm showing the condition of where we have uh, no adhesive, no adhesive legs until you look far far down into the photograph, um, and the black is the back of the tile. There should be adhesive there. So, in this case, we have part of a. Uh, I'm going to call it an adhesive failure that it broke down because of moisture. Interesting. Cliff, did you have a follow-up or did we get to that already? No, we, we got it. Thanks. We got it. Next one, John. That's the other hole. You notice it's there's no concrete dust. It's a mush. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Excellent. Excellent graphics. Okay. Next one, John. What do we have here, Bob? Dark we spot. Have, we have mystery black spots. Um, I forgot the species of this wood, but it's a direct lute out to concrete. And that black spot is actually moisture coming from the concrete into the wood. And it's creating the dark color. Interesting. Do you recall what was the source of the moisture there? Um, concrete emission. Concrete. So is that, is, is, that, is, is that microbial or it's just, uh, you know, tannins and things like that that are in the wood causing the stain? I think you're, it's mostly tannins in that, but the next picture shows mm -hmm. something different. Okay. Uh, there you got some, I'm going to call them black spots, which could be bacterial right. growth. Uh, right. I'm, this is the other room I was in. And by chance, when I, I, well, first of all, I had permission to do destructive testing, but when I pulled it up, the lady was at the door, which is on the other side. And all of a sudden she screamed out because she smelled mildew. Mm -hmm. And uh, the determining factor was the installation. They did not do any prior testing and of the, of the concrete before they put the wood floor down. And it was also a water damage remediation contractor who did this work. Interesting, Bob. Next one, John. Okay, what do we, this is a side view of the same project? Uh, this, yeah, this is just a, where I took it out to side view showing where the... Uh, there's a void between the back of the wood plank and the surface of the concrete uh, uh, where we had a you know, basic breakdown of the adhesive. Interesting. Next one, John. What do we have here, Bob? That one is interesting. <clears throat> that is uh, in Miami, a um, place called Fisher Island, one of the brand new condominiums. It's porcelain tile. Uh, they call yeah. it a, uh, a cocoa color. And as you see, it's white. Well, this is porcelain tile exterior, 10,000 square feet patio installed with a mud set on top of a concrete slab, which is on top of a parking garage. So mm -hmm. they had effluorescence coming through the joints and they had one of their contractors, uh, employees come by with a power washer and basically etched the porcelain tile to a point where 
efflores has spread. Now, when you look at to the right of the picture, you see a diagonal line. That is a crack. And oh, oh. the oh. efflores has come through and kind of drained, uh, not drained, but you know, followed the water followed, and then you have the huge white spots. There's another couple of more pictures on this one. Stronger than that. There you go. Wow. There, that's that's the problem when you don't clean porcelain correctly, and you think you can get away with, uh, you know, using something from Home Depot from the shelf that has not been professionally uh, applied or or used or even specified. What so a great lesson. In the end, this is a replacement because you can't grind, you can't uh, hone or resurface porcelain. So it's got to come up and the new one put down. And I believe they did not put a moisture barrier um, underneath before they put down the tile. What a great lesson. Next one, John. This is one of my favorites. Um, I'm currently working on the uh, IICRC S800 uh, redo, and um, I was awarded the uh, chair for the woven chapter of that document because it didn't have one before. And this is one of the examples of using the sticky plastic, putting it on something to prevent uh, the carpet from getting soiled. Well, what happens is if you leave this on too long, which is usually the case, and you take it up, well, you're gonna you're gonna break down the tip of the of the twist of each uh, fiber yarn, and then you're gonna have a sticky residue because it does stay on, on whether it's nylon or wool doesn't matter it stays on the uh, on the tip of the carpet. And then you've got to get a guy who really knows how to get that break down that adhesive to get rid of it. Otherwise, you're gonna have uh, general soiling in the area because it's basically glue and it will attract all kinds of dirt and hold on to it. Wow. Hey, Bob, are you going to be able to stick around for an extra five or 10 minutes? Yes. Because I, I want to go to the roundup, but we'll do that at one o'clock because this is just too good to stop right now. Let's go to the next one. That is the same carpet after it was pulled up, but not cleaned. After it was, I'm sorry. The, this is a photograph of the same carpet. Um, in an adjoining area uh, where they don't have the plastic. It's just a reference photograph. Okay. Okay. Next one, John. Here we go. What do we have here, Bob? This is unique. The, um, the dealer used his best installer to install this uh, woven carpet in the men's locker room of a country club in central Florida. Mm. As you can see, it's waved. Yeah. And the next photograph, I believe, I have, yeah, I've got the orange line down the center. That's my string line to, to have a straight pattern. And it, of course, it's not straight, it's not aligned, it's wavy. What they did was they, they aligned the pattern at the seams only and did not align it in the center by, and it's a double stick glue down over a, a treadmill pad, but they did not use a power stretcher to make sure that everything was straight and it always takes at least three men for this sort of thing two on the floor and one to stand up and make sure the pattern is aligned visually so what was the solution they removed and replaced this remove and replace now okay. the unique part of this the dealer who sold and installed this carpet was also a member of the club <laughs> okay <laughs> talk about yeah. embarrassment and an expensive embarrassment too, I'm sure. Yes. What, what are we showing here, Bob? We're showing a unique, um, what's the word? Uh, the faux silk. It's a, it's a carpet. It's a, one of the high-end carpets. And I'm, I was sent there to look at the seams and what's going on with the seams. And in this case, uh, the seam is totally visible. It's got gapping, it's got overlap, it has tuft in the uh, adhesive is just plain lousy workmanship. Hmm. And that was just, oh, there we go. There's another, yeah. is this another spot in the same? Yeah, place? it's another, it's another section, the same one. And uh, it's just, the man does not know what to do with woven carpets. That's what this shows. 
I see. It looks like it's almost kind of crowning there to some degree. Well, that's the other thing. It is crowning because of the way he did the scene. Interesting. Okay. Next. So was that fixable? No. Yeah. No. no. Remove and replace you got again. In there, you got two seams. And this is the same carpet. You notice the backing on it. It's a unique backing from the, uh, the Asian manufacturers. Hmm. And um, the tax strip is the wrong tax strip because it's only a two row. It should have been a three row pin, the, com the commercial architectural one. And then uh, at the nails, we have little uh, brown spots, which, and the nails are very dark because they're rusted because this had a previous water leak. And the, and the tax strip should have been replaced. Interesting. Next one. What do we have here, Bob? That's one of the fake uh, silk rugs. Um, you can see whenever you, if, if, even if you sneeze on it, the, the pile will go in a different direction and you can't change the appearance of it. And I was sent there for um, pulling tufts. The next picture shows it. There you go. Um, when you're looking at rugs like this, they basically do not have tough bind. There's no such thing as a tough bind in the wool rug. And these tufts were being pulled out because the vacuum brush, the rotating brush was uh, too close to the uh, carpet. Therefore, as it, it was combing it and pulling the tufts out. Uh, one of these rugs, uh, many of the high-end rugs in wool and, and um, the faux silk, they want you to use a suction only vacuum because the the weakness of the uh, the ability for the for the fiber fiber yarn to be pulled out with a brush. Yeah, you, know, you bring up that's a great point there, Bob. And I, I have a quick question on that. Like when I I have a little bit of carpet here, and I I always wonder how do I determine? You know, my my vacuum adjusts. I've got a sanitaire HEPA vac. It adjusts. Um, how do I determine what level to put that at when I'm sweeping the floor here, vacuuming? Well, when you feel the bottom of the of the head plate of the vacuum, uh, and you look at it visually, if the brush extends is extended past the the head plate, you're going to have this problem. It's it should be level with the head plate. Okay. Um, when you're using the brush all the way down, that's, I believe, typically for a hard surface vacuuming because it'll sweep everything up. Yeah, I've just kind of said, all right, halfway down is for the carpet, all the way down is for the hard flooring. And uh, I, I might be off a little bit on that, but I appreciate you commenting on it. Let's go to the next one, John. Here's an interesting one. This is a woven carpet again, wool, and the alignment of the pattern uh, is the reason I was called in there. And the next photograph, uh, by the way, this is what we, yeah, there's the, um, the seam. And uh, a few things the installer did not do is cut the seam uh, clean, apply a seam sealer. And then uh, he tried to align a pattern in certain areas, but not in all areas because he did not know what to do with a power stretcher. Interesting. And any more? Here's another. Okay, this is the same job, I believe. Same job. You can see to the left the uh, profile of the seaming tape. Um, that we have a slight ridge that's about three, three and a half inches in, in width. Uh, he used normal seaming tape. They make a special seaming hot melt tape for a double stick installation that does not have a profile. Fascinating stuff, Bob. Any more, John? Here we go. What, what do we have here? It looks like somebody spilled some paint on a carpet. I was called into a hotel. This is their uh, ballroom. And uh, this is a black oil-based paint. And the next picture will show, there you go. Uh, mm. Somebody decided to walk through the ballroom as a shortcut, and he did not know his paint, a can of black paint had a hole at the bottom. So we got this line that's about 50 feet long. I was wow. calling to find out what can be done. And the first thing I said, well, your uh, painting contractor has liability insurance. And if this can't be cleaned successfully, uh, you're, good, you're good for a replacement. And that's when the lady said, well, it was one of our employees. So no. I'll travel. That hurts. <laughs> Any more, John? So then... 
here is a close up of, of an area I tested. Um, in these cases, I always use a Q tip. So having done a, f a few spots around using a Q tip and a, uh, I'm going to say a paint remover chemical, I determined that it's cleanable. And there's only one or two people in South Florida I would trust to even do this. Well, I gave the uh, hotel the names of both contractors who are certified and extremely knowledgeable, and they successfully removed all the paint. Interesting. And right. he used Q-tips as well as I did. Oh, he did. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So uh, any more? Pricey. A little pricey. <laughs> okay. What do we have here? This... This, looks this is a typical uh, drawing of a custom wool rug that uh, you would get from any custom wool manufacturer. Um, there, there's many of them. Uh, most of them are based in uh, the, the manufacturing facility. Uh, could be Mexico, Turkey, India, China. You know, they're all over the world. And when someone orders a rug, this is the color placement and the pattern design that they accept, that they approve. Very interesting. Uh, I've already got comments. We need to bring you back with more slides the next time, Bob. So uh, we'll be looking to hook up again. Let's get that last one. What, the, what is it? No, go back to that one with the guy holding it. What is that, Bob? Why is that in there? That is the rug that, you, that I have in a previous picture. I was sent by the manufacturer to find out how come the rug has uh, wrinkles and bent stuff and it's, it's just not laying flat. Well, when they took the rug off the, uh, the shelving. This is the condition that it came off the shelving in. And right then and there, I knew the problem. Uh, wow. The pole broke, if there was a pole, and mismanagement of uh, manhandling. And then when it was unrolled, the, the floor that you see, the concrete floor in the warehouse, it was black with rubber residue from the tires, from plain dirt. Uh, they didn't, they don't sweep it, they don't clean it, they don't do anything. They enrolled the rug, and um, that's what a, what a picture I was measuring the, the border work and the resolution to that. Yeah, that's the rug itself. And there I'm measuring the, uh, the border that it was not consistent, and the beveling along the edge was, uh, was uh, not consistent as well. So uh, I knew a man who does all this work. Uh, in fact, my company, I used to uh, do this type of work. And he went back and re recut the uh, circumference, put a bevel on it, and everybody was and uh, blocked it out so that the wrinkles went away, and everybody was happy. Fascinating, Bob. Excellent. Um, one more. Let's look at this one. This is, I think, a very common one, isn't it? This is a very interesting case as well. I earlier mentioned about the half a million square feet of uh, uh, failed LVT floors. This is one of them. Um, this is 50,000 square feet in a nine-story nine building of a, uh, a low-income housing development. And the crowning is the problem. This is where I determined and had testing done. The product was defective in manufacturing and also in workmanship by the installer because of the way he uh, proceeded without going by the rules. First rule being no moisture testing and installing it under no HVAC system. So this was replaced. Interesting. Cliff, did you have a, a follow-up from uh, text? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, a question uh, actually from one of the uh, listeners. Can you render a professional opinion on OSB used as subfloor because it swells at the edges, especially where cut to install, thus eliminating the waxed edges? All right. Uh, I've got a case in multi, uh, multi unit housing in the Keys in Marathon that they used OSB in a modular house, modular uh, prefabricated unit. And uh, it was uh, manufactured in the north and shipped down on a trailer truck to the Keys uh, with a crane. It's placed on the um, concrete sti uh, stilts that we, we have now in the building code uh, due to hurricane. Uh, hurricane waters and whatnot. And then they put another one on top and you have a two-story house and it's OSB that's used. Um, the manufacturer called me to go down and find out what's going on. 
by the way, it was a vinyl floor, LVT floor that was glued to the OSB in uh, in a northern uh, environment and shipped the, to the Keys, which is, if, it, if it's 80 and 80, that's interior RH and exterior and, and uh, exterior temperature in RH. I mean, it's, it's interesting. So the unit itself is sealed uh, from the bottom, the top, the sides, it's an envelope, it's air conditioned. And once the air conditioning was turned on, it started sucking in moisture from outside, from someplace. And the interior equilibrium between the exterior and interior was going on. And the result was the adhesive was destroyed by, by moisture content and the uh, OSB swelled and uh, it cost the man quite a bit of money. Hmm. Uh, a few months later, he called me back and said, Bob, you cost me a lot of money with that, that work in the Keys, but I'll tell you what, we now do not use OSB for any flooring substrate. We go strictly to three quarter inch plywood, problem solved. That's why OSB as a flooring material is very difficult to work with because you frankly don't know what it's gonna do. And also some of the adhesives we have cannot marry up to the resins and, and whatnot that's in the OSB. Very interesting. John, let's go to the roundup, buddy. All right, I'm gonna give my last question to Pete Consigli, the restoration industry global watchdog. Pete. Well, Hey, Bob, really fascinating interview. I Actually, in all the years I've been working with the two boys here and helping recruit a lot of these shows, this is the first one that I can recall that, that it's run over this far. I, I can't remember the last time, to be honest with you. That's quite a tribute to the interest of the show. You know, I, I, a couple things come to mind. If I, if I knew ahead of time, how much stuff you knew about this. I kind of knew you knew a lot. Of that. I think I would have renamed the show, you know, everything you want to know about flooring, but we're afraid to ask <laughs> dealt with moisture, insulation, glue, stupid stuff contractors do, dumb decisions property owners make. I won't yep. say anything about the manufacturers because our friend William called in and he's on there. So I don't want to <laughs> get his nose all punched out of shape. I will tell you the other thing now, so a lot of, you know, you're, you're the East Coast enforcer for the moisture mob. And of course, we had your counterpart from San Jose, Mr. Roland on, which was really a very fascinating interview. Uh, and this is a, a little background. It's going to lend to kind of question some stuff I want you to comment on. Uh, but the one thing I will tell you is Roland, uh, he went and left the house without his American Express card. You know, those commercials don't leave home without it. Right. In the context, in the context of a flooring inspector guy, don't leave home without your PowerPoint photos and the case studies. <laughs> now I'm sure Roland has a whole bunch of those, and his interview was great. But uh, you, uh, you really, really kicked it up, and uh, it's very fascinating. So listen, um, oh, listen, there we got William. We got William all excited there. That's a, that's a good thing, Bob. If we get William excited, we know we're on the right track. You know, uh, <laughs> So listen, I got a couple of things to kind of wrap this show up. Uh, I, you know, my feeling is, and I had, uh, we had a little dialogue when we were kind of writing the show up with, uh, with Joe and Cliff and stuff on this. A lot of people don't really understand the role of a third party evaluator, a guy, you know, these flooring guys, because really flooring guys are, are, are really moisture experts and moisture is a big issue within their air quality, uh, you know, restoration jobs, you had a lot of those remediation case studies. And I think it's kind of a big secret, you know, in air quotes, that there are people in the restoration remediation industry who don't really understand and know that they need to. You know, that, that I mean, guys like you, you know, the old saying, people don't know what they don't know. Right. Because they don't really understand what it is you all do and the power of a third party impartial, you know, uh, kind of assessment which was a big point that that Roland made in his and you know you guys really are kind of bookends in that regard so I want to give you some opportunity to finish up tell the audience and for Cliff to take some notes for the blog you know you, you really are almost you, you're kind of the, the face of the flooring inspectors and um, 
you've done a lot of work. You've had a lot of history trying to organize the industry through your uh, nifty group. You've been involved in the trade journals in the past. You know, you do a lot of field work now. And, uh, you know, your organization uh, bought the stock in the IICRC. And I kind of think you're looking for a niche and some place to land where you fit. And um, to really kind of, I don't want to say, get the get the respect but really get the recognition in the larger industry that you're part of so why don't you talk a little bit about that journey you know where you see your group going where you see you all fitting in and you know i mean i i really mean this from my heart bob i i think uh been watching you, you know, the last year or two since you kind of got involved with the group and i i think you're really a good spokesman and doing a great job and so uh why don't you just share some of your thoughts on that you know, uh, we didn't really get into that in the, in the questions, and uh, I think that's important. So anyway, that that's kind of my contribution to this. So anyway, I'll turn it back over to you, my friend. Thanks, Pete. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, as far as the IICRC, uh, I uh, put my name in a hat for a board uh, a board person. I was elected October first last year. Uh, so I not only represent the uh, the National Institute of Certified Floor Covering Inspectors as a shareholder rep, I'm also on the board uh, of the IICRC now. And through that, the the chairman asked me if I wanted to take over the inspection division because it uh, wasn't doing much. So I you know raised my hand and uh, like it, when I was in the army, they said, "Okay, who's got a driver's license? Put your hand up." Okay, you see that wheelbarrow up there? Go start, fill it up and bring it someplace. So you never know what you get into when you say, yes, I will, uh, especially when volunteering. So I took the inspection chair and through that, I want to do the same thing I did with NIF, NIFKI, NICFI, is to promote the inspection business, how to be a businessman, how to perform better and how to, in the end, make more money, charge more. So... I'm now on uh, on a program with the IICRC to improve the inspection division to get awareness out there, and to and to have people find out. Yes, it's a career path. You can do it, no problem. I'm, after all, uh, one of the things I did when I was 45 years old, I stopped installing on a regular basis. I because I wanted to be able to stand up and walk when I was 65, and it worked. Um, and I'm making the same kind of money, if not a little bit better, because I have no employees now. It's just me. So the idea of becoming an inspector and promoting it, um, I belong to two other organizations. Um, one is the NAFCT, I believe. Uh, they are a training academy for not only inspection courses, but also for floor covering installation. I'm involved with a, another group out in uh, California, which is uh, organizing a training pro program for Job Corps so that the uh, the kids coming out of Job Corps can actually be a good uh, advanced helper or a intermarry uh, installer when they come out of the two-year program. So I'm heavily involved in, in training on both coasts. That's four board of director, uh, four boards I happen to sit on, two for training and two for uh, inspection. And I will continue to promote it wherever I go because uh, it's a good career path. You don't it, you don't have to be an installer uh, your whole life. If, if you have the ability to write reports and speak well to people, then you can become an inspector and you're going to make the same kind of money. And when you get into the legal work, well, that's where I like to see people getting published because attorneys like to be published. And I always figure as long as I'm at, at about 50% of what an attorney charges, I'll always have a job. <laughs> I'll tell you, Bob, this has been fascinating. Really, uh, really a pleasure to get a chance to chat with you a little bit. Uh, great interview. Is Before we go, is there anything we missed that you'd like to add? Hey, Joe. Pete? Joe, let me, right. I, I just, just want to weigh in with one thing and maybe Bob can comment. I mean, I think a, a really important role that Bob and a lot of the guys like him, like Roland, there's a bunch of these guys around the country and in Canada, guys like Clayton Shell, you know, he calls in often. These, yes. these guys, I think, really could provide a service to the restoration indoor air quality industry, but I don't think those industries really know and understand what they do. So, and this particularly from the third party, you know, an impartial viewpoint, 
to come in and look objectively at these things, you know, not necessarily working directly for the manufacturer, someone like that, but just as a troubleshooter. So that's something that, quite frankly, Bob, maybe in your closing comments, address that. And I think your group, you guys should market more to that. I mean, I know you've been to the contractor connections and some of the cleaning shows, but I think if you push that envelope, I think I think it'll help the profile for all the guys who do the work that you do. So anyway, all I can say, my friend, is hats off to you, sir. And you're a patriot, too, for all the years that you served the country in the Guard. I want to recognize you for that, too. I'll turn it back to you, Radio Joan Cliff. Thank you, Pete. Uh, I would say in closing, use the use of a third party expert, no matter what the uh, product or the task or the trade may be, uh, is valuable. Just like when you have a building that you want to build, you go for the architect who draws the drawings for you and, and, and promotes uh, this is how it's going to be, you know, this is how it's going to be done because he knows the why. And the GC is called in to build a building uh, because he can. Uh, handle and manage what the subs do as far as building the building. In the flooring business, uh, I have performed as the pre, during, and post installation process where I've evaluated the, uh, the space prior to any installation or all to make sure that it's, uh, the uh, installer has control of the workspace, that the, every, all the climatizing is okay and whatnot. And during the installation, I've been called in to, to uh, make sure the seams come out right and woven goods, to make sure they use some power stretchers and whatnot. And in the end, uh, on some of the manufacturers called me in on very large jobs to evaluate the job site at that point in time so that if there's a problem down the road, I've already been ev evaluated it and they can say, hey, look at this. This is what it, how you guys turn it over. It's not us. So... There's, uh, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, typically, when I walk on a job site, there's always at least one person that will hate me. And it's, uh, to me, the business has been good. And I will promote it the way I have today. You know, Don Weeks texted in, and I, he, he kind of read my mind. You should be instructing indoor air quality inspectors at the IAQA conference as well. So we'll put a, a, put a bug in their ear because um, there's a lot of indoor air quality inspectors that could use a, a more solid background on flooring, Bob, and, and you've provided a lot of that here today. We really want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. I have one more example I just thought of, if I may, because I think it's going to be important. Go ahead. Uh, I have a two-story building, two-story resident, and uh, half the house upstairs, wood flooring was flat, everything was fine. The other half of the house, the wood flooring has been cupped. Same wood floor, same installation time, but I was calling in to find out why is one side cupped and the other side not? Well, I went through my uh, process and protocol and in the end, I figured, well, let me look at something. So I asked her where the air conditioning is and how many zones. Well, they have four zones in the house, two upstairs and two downstairs. I looked at the uh, air conditioning units Poked my in the in the, uh, the release drain. I poked my finger in there. One side was totally wet. The other side was totally dry, and that was the problem. The HVAC wasn't working properly. Hmm. Interesting, so, Bob. It's indoor air quality uh, concerning. Absolutely, absolutely, fantastic stuff. Thank you, Bob Bavarian, Bob uh, Robert Bavarian, Bob Blockinger. Great show today. Really appreciate it. Talking a little bit about flooring forensics and uh, hard surface inspection, and uh, I think Bob, you're going to help get that. You know, the IICRC is the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. That inspection part hasn't gotten quite as much attention as the others, I think you're going to bring a lot more attention to it. So that's, we appreciate having you. That's my intention. Thank you. All right. So this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Bob Blockinger. Thanks to John Faith at the controls, Cliff Slotnick, my co-host, of course, our growing group of loyal listeners and our sponsors. We'll be back now. By the way, next Friday, we've got another, uh, another one of Pete's buddies. Paula Grange will be joining us next week. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Cajun country and flooding and building science. Looking forward to a great show next Friday at noon with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. 
For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 